There we are, waiting. Right, we are live, we are recording as well. So I just want to kind of say hi again. So hi, it's uh, Kate from Sleep Time Consulting. I am back for day two. Um, so day two is, well, I, I keep saying these are the most important sessions, but this is one of the most popular ones um, in terms of the information that I'm going to give you. Uh, because we're going to be talking about bedtimes. We are going to be talking about... Uh, settling um, and we're also going to talk about routines but it's the settling part that most people ask the questions for and this is the one thing I'm kind of quite proud of in a way because often people will talk about um, bedtime and routines um, but they won't talk about how to settle your child and I'll always share that with you I really want you to have the right information for you so that you can help your little one to settle that's the whole kind of thing um, but I will also say that no one situation is the same. Um, we all kind of have our own different ways of doing things, our own different parenting ethoses, and that's really also really, really important to understand. So I've had a couple of questions about how to navigate away from, let's say, breastfeeding to sleep and settling to sleep, and we'll talk about that. Um, but you've got to remember that your child is unique which is brilliant, and that's what bring, makes them so amazing. Um, and you've got to do what works for you. So if any of this is kind of confusing or doesn't feel right or you're, like, tried out for, then there often is another way. I am obviously talking to everyone, um, but I really want to make sure that I'm helping you out. So remember, you can always get help from me. The um, best way to do that is to head to um, Sleep Time Consulting, fill out the waiting list form just to tell me a bit more about it um, and then we can always have a chat. That's kind of the starting point to any kind of more in-depth um, analysis, especially if you're a bit like, I don't know what she's talking about because I don't want that to happen. So please do let me know. We can arrange a free chat initially just to see what might suit you best. But um, this is, that's the way to do it. So over to sleeptimeconsulting.co.uk. Right, so let's go. So the first thing we'll talk about is the timing of bed. Now, yesterday I spoke a little bit about the body clock and um, it's really important. The body clock is so powerful. Like it's really um, such a thing that we can help ourselves with. It's like the one, you know, it, when we talk about holistic sleep coaching versus kind of strict sleep coaching measures, this these sort of things are the ones that you need to think about because if you're going to help yourself, then you're halfway there, aren't you? So by by respecting the body clock and understanding what control it has over our bodies we can help our little ones to feel sleepy so the reason to do that is because melatonin which is the sleepy hormone is produced at um close to bedtime so it builds up towards the end of the day as it recognizes that the sleep pressure is um is building and what it does is it starts to help your child to feel sleepy so if we have the same kind of bedtime each day, then our bodies will feel such feel tired at the same time each day. And that's how we can naturally help each other. So that's why we talk about a good, consistent bedtime. So most children, a seven o'clock bedtime is a good idea. If you've got a newborn, you might want to have it later because there's lots of naps going on the day. Um, probably past the age of about three, four months, you can start to get closer to kind of newborn, uh, sorry, to seven o'clock. Um, but before then, you might just want to kind of let them nap a bit longer, so up and then down, because that might store up a bit more sleep for in the nighttime for you. And then hopefully when they go to sleep, you might be able to get a bit of sleep as well. So bear that in mind from a newborn. But from that sort of three month um, onwards, try and head for somewhere around a three sorry, um, a seven o'clock bedtime. And it's all related to your awake times, which we will, we did sort of touch on a bit yesterday, but I'll talk, talk more about um, in the kind of the daytime section. Um, now, the reason awake times are important is because it's how long your child can stay awake for needing to go to sleep. And this is where your bedtime might shift a little bit because when your child gets close to changing their nap, their, their nap so if they're transitioning from three to two, two to one, one to zero, their bedtime might need to get a bit later um, before they transition because they can stay awake for longer. And that's essentially what's happening when they transition their naps. Or when you've made that nap transition, you might need to make the bedtime a bit earlier. And that's kind of also what happens in that, that phase. So that's when you might vary your bedtime. And um, to put it into context, <clears throat> you do, you can alter bedtime as they get older. Um, my eight-year-old now is um, just gone eight o'clock. I mean, COVID did make 
and bedtime a little bit more tricky because our routine's slightly out of place. Um, and so my 11 year old is a little bit later than that as well. So it's not really until that age you start um, uh, kind of altering bedtime. And I, I did a talk in schools a couple of years ago um, and I was really surprised how late even the little ones went to bed. So try and keep your, your evenings, try and keep your bedtimes a good time to help your little ones stay in the right state of tiredness because if we pull on over tiredness, then you're gonna be suffering greater. Um, and so it's not the only thing, but it's worth considering that if your child's overtired, then you're gonna to struggle to get them to sleep. Just a quick note on that though, um, overtiredness versus undertiredness, it gets banded around a lot in the sleep terms, but overtiredness is when your little one might look a bit um, fractious, a little bit irrational, um, kind of very upset about life, um, in an older child, it'd be like them running around crazy, like for no reason. Um, and that's because they're, they're, they can't handle being awake anymore and they've passed that point of tiredness. Um, so at that point, just do anything to get them to go down to sleep and try and avoid it in the future. Make the bedtime earlier or your nap earlier if you're looking at naps. And then under tiredness is when they're, they're just not tired enough to sleep. So they'll just be cheeky, resisting, smiling, you know, happy. So that is kind of one thing to also consider. And sometimes, you know, if you've had like a danger nap in the afternoon and you're trying to put your child down at the same time, you'll be like, mm, they're just not tired enough. Try not to fight under tiredness either. It can be quite difficult. Um, just make your bedtime half an hour later and see if that, that kind of helps. So yeah, the time of your bed is, is good to keep solid and good to keep consistent but good to kind of be able to flex if need be i will tell you a quick story that um i did uh, a few years ago we flexed our child's our children's bedtime when they were much younger let them stay up for another hour because we have friends who have a barbecue disaster they were up all night never doing it again never have done it again in fact <laughs> so yeah uh, flex it within reason that's the kind of the key thing okay so um, when it comes to routine around bedtime, that's another great thing to do is have a thought about a consistent routine. I spoke yesterday about consistency and how important it is to show your little ones that journey, show your little ones what's happening. And this can happen from an early age and it doesn't need to be much more than, you know, like having a bath, having a feed, um, getting changed, maybe a massage or something, maybe a story if they're interested, and then into bed and really you could slightly alter some of those things, um, especially the feed maybe and the massage, but that will stand you in good stead for the future. So if you keep that consistency going, they'll start to recognize that this is what happens around um, bedtime. So have your routine, don't make it too long, half an hour maximum, maybe longer if you've got a long feed going on um, and, and kind of work it your way. If you've got an older one, uh, you know, kind of a toddler or older child that's a bit resistant around bedtime, then make sure you're Working with them, perhaps you can draw out their bedtime routine, you know, get some pictures of the internet, do a little diagram, whatever it is, um, you know, kind of work through the flow of what bedtime looks like, different stages, have a little map of the different stages of bedtime, what they need to do, and then get them to subscribe to it. So with an older one, you could do, if you've got like a timing issue, they love to spend hours in the bath, set a timer and make it into a game. So like when the time goes off, we've got to get ready, and we've got to get ready in, I don't know, three minutes, whatever it is, if you need to try and regain the control, make it into a fun thing, um, or get them to sort of tick off the stages that they're going on, put a sticker on them, something like that. It's something you can then look at, perhaps rewarding for good behavior, and it really helps to get them on side, get them kind of um, you know, in that zone with it all. Um, so yeah, those routines can be really, really helpful just to stay on track and start that journey to sleep. And on your journey to sleep, think about that kind of light levels as well. So um, around uh, an hour at least before bedtime, try and bring the light levels down. And the, that again is to help the melatonin to be produced because it doesn't like bright light. So that means no screens, ideally one hour before bed. And there is science behind that, the blue light from a screen helps us, sorry, stops the melatonin from being produced, so stops them from being sleepy. So it makes sense to remove that from their environment, bring the light levels down if you can, um, and get them to kind of get ready for bed. So bear that in mind as you're going through your routines. But now let's talk about the settling. So what I'm talking about here is moving towards independent settling. And the reason why I'm talking about that is that yesterday I spoke about the need for a child to be able to go through their own sleep cycles. So they need to be able to go round and round their sleep cycles. And it's that moment of wakefulness that 
We don't want them to be waking up unnecessarily. Some babies will need to wake and they will need to wake for feeds um, and they might need to wake for comfort. And if you're okay with that, fine. We're talking about trying to get them more confident in terms of settling. So if you have a child that initially can settle well and independently, um, then it's more likely that they're going to link their sleep cycles. Again, just in case, if you have a child that doesn't settle independently but sleeps well, you don't need to change anything. Please do not alter anything um, on this basis. I'm talking about ways and means of doing it that might help you. So if we go on a sort of a sliding scan, this is how I like to kind of explain it because everyone is kind of different. Everyone's situation is different. If we go from a really, really involved um, settling process and this might be something you want to consider if you've got a lot of time um, if you've got a very closely uh, connected um, sleep association so you know kind of how they fall asleep this could be like feeding to sleep or perhaps rocking to sleep as well um, then what you want to do is you want to consider how um, how your little one is settling now and then try and think about what you want them to get to so I would suggest that you start off with a a kind of an involved approach that might look a little bit like transitioning them from what they're doing. So let's say you're feeding sleep. You might just want to hold them to sleep to begin with, then and rock them perhaps, and then stop rocking them to sleep over a few days, then start trying to lower them down in a slightly more awake manner than normal and keep going on that basis until you're able to help them a little bit, but then place them down into their sleep space. It's really um, kind of involved. It's taken from a form of... Um, a habit stacking that Lindsay Hookway is a great, great sleep coach um, out there. She's a sleep educator, really. She's um, a very brilliant at kind of the gentle and holistic side of things. So these are one of the things that I've learned from a course I did with her. Um, so that habit stacking is like taking one habit, moving on to the next one, and then moving on to the next one until you're getting towards that kind of more um, independent sleep. And at any point along that journey, you can stop and stay where you are. You don't need to kind of work to this perfect putting down if everything's okay. Now that can take a long time and can take a lot of perseverance. So some people like to slightly shortcut those sort of things. So the next kind of way of looking at it is to move on to a slightly more removed way of doing that, but very, very responsive. So you could look at um, helping your little one to settle by placing them down into their sleep space. Um, if they get upset, you could then pick them back up again, give them some comfort. Um, and then go back to kind of pushing them down again and repeat that until they settle. So you're looking at a kind of a pick up, put down kind of approach. Um, and then that, again, that can take a little bit of time. It can be quite helpful. It's um, a good one to sort of limit upset um, as well and can be good for younger babies. Certain older babies just don't quite get it because they are, um, they are a bit confused about being put down and then picked up and it's a bit too confusing for them, especially as they get older, but it's an option for you to use if you want to be very responsive. So then the middle ground, I'd say, is probably something like a gradual retreat or disappearing chair kind of method. So that looks like, um, you know, kind of putting your child into their sleep space, offering them lots of reassurance um, whilst they're down in their uh, cot or their, um, well, if they're sleeping in, I could be connecting with them. And then you could be looking at kind of trying to keep them calm, maybe picking them up if they don't calm, but sort of staying with them. And then over perhaps every three to five days, just move a little bit further away, less in your involvement until you've kind of got to, um, you know, the edge of the room and then go out of the room and leave them to settle that way. So you're sort of doing it in stages. You might be right close to them in the middle of the room, by the door, and then you're out of the room. Um, and then that's the kind of, yeah, so gradual retreat quite method. Then the, the the one before the really super strict method is a form of control crying. Um, and I'm not a big fan of, of lots of crying. Uh, you'll hear me say that quite a lot. Um, I'm very much one that kind of likes to try and find the way that uh, minimizes the upset. But sometimes we get to the point whereby these kids just need a bit of space to figure it out for themselves. And as long as you're okay with that, then it's okay. There are many studies that will talk about, um, you know, the pros and cons of this, and you need to find your your place in the world with it all. But um, my view is you should never leave your child for a long period of time upset. And as long as you have a secure attachment, sorry, a secure attachment attachment with them um, in the rest of the day, and that means you know you're in a loving, caring um, parent that uh, for the the rest of the time, then you're going to be um, helping them to settle, helping them to sleep well. So. A controlled 
crying approach does vary also, but it looks along the lines of mainly put them into their sleep space, um, taking into account lots of other things remember we've got it we'll talk about daytime we've got the right bedtime going on we've had a good bedtime routine um and you are looking at leaving them to settle for, on their own so you'd say good night walk out the room if they then get upset you would wait a few minutes you can determine sometimes i work on two minutes sometimes we go up to 10 um, and then after that time you go in you reassure them then you leave again and you repeat this cycle as, as time goes on. And that control crying is one of the, the options that people, um, it's quite a common option that people use. And I think it's, it, it can work quite well. It can be a bit speedier than perhaps the habit stacking that we initially talked about. Um, but it needs to be considered as part of everything, not just bedtime. You need to make sure your child isn't too overtired, they're well fed, they're well winded. All of those things are really, really important. And then the last option um, is looking at the extinction method. Not something I've ever recommended, um, but this is literally walking out, closing the door and seeing your child in the morning, whatever noise they make. It's quite old school. Um, it's taken from a um, book by Ferber. Um, yeah, I do, this is pretty much all I want to say about it because it's not something I'd really like to recommend by any means. It's very much, see you later, sort it out yourself, which, I think it's a bit short-sighted because there's often needs dates that need to be addressed. So those are the kind of the options, probably four options, because I'll discount the last one as you can sense, about how to get your little one to settle. It all starts with where you are and where you want to get to, doesn't it? Um, the end result for me is being able to put your child down awake so that they can settle themselves calmly. And it can take a few days, it can take a few weeks. But in the work that I do with clients, it's transformational what we can do you know what when you give it the focus when you take everything else into account it can be really really life-changing um to be able to walk down and put your child into their bed and um be able to help them to settle themselves i spoke to a mum the other day who was spending two hours two hours settling their little one 10 months old and i really really felt for her because she was she was like i don't mind getting up in the night i just i'm so exhausted by seven o'clock that i've got two hours ahead of me and it doesn't need to be that way. And I think that's what you need to know. It does not need to be that it takes hours and hours for you to settle your little one. It can be as simple as saying goodnight, walking out the room and they go to sleep. So I really want to encourage you to consider your situation and see what's going on. And um, I've talked a lot about, there's a lot of detail in that. So please do let me know if you've got any questions. This is the big thing that I, I focus on trying to, and I work with clients is finding the right option for you. There are tweaks within what I've just spoken about and there are ways of uh, making it work for you. So if you do want to discuss that further, then please do get in touch and consider uh, filling out the waiting list over at sleeptimeconsulting.co.uk. But I'm going to leave it for there for now. I'm not done badly in terms of timing. So I hope that was useful. Let me know any feedback and any questions. And I will be back tomorrow with more chat. Take care and have a lovely afternoon. Bye.